all right so let's get started so in today's class uh, uh, we will try to get the big picture in today's lecture and i think we have maybe 12 or 13 lectures uh, so at the end of uh, today's lecture I will brief you on uh, what will be the plan for the course for the rest of the semester. For the, this is a half course. I think 12 to 13 lectures should be there. We will see. And I guess you all did the computer systems organization course, right? So if you see uh, the evolution of processors, so initially in your uh, computer systems organization course, you would have studied uh, what are called as single cycle processors. In single cycle processors, uh, every instruction gets executed in one clock cycle. Every instruction gets executed in one clock cycle. And in general, if you think about the execution paradigm in uh, if you keep the processor architecture aside, if you keep the processor architecture aside, logically speaking, what do you see? What a processor does is it fetches an instruction and it decodes the instruction. That is, it understands what the instruction is and then uh, it executes. Them. It executes the instruction. So this fetch decode execute cycle is the semantics that is exposed to the uh, programmer, okay? When we say programmer, it could be the assembly language programmer or the compiler writer. But someone who is uh, programming in C, C++ or any higher level programming language, they may not be aware of this uh, uh, abstraction exposed by the processor. So the processor exposes this fetch decode execute abstraction. Ah, I, see. I already see a problem. Okay, I think I should. Okay, I have not used the writing pad, it doesn't work. Just bear with me for today. We will fix all these glitches. Yeah. So there is a fetch decode execute paradigm which the processor exposes uh, to the programmers. Uh, but this semantics is uh, realized in different ways by the underlying processor designer or uh, hardware uh, engineer. So the simplest uh, physical realization of the semantics is what is called as a single cycle processor, where the instruction is fetched, decoded, and executed within a single clock cycle. That is the simplest uh, way of realizing the processor. The second approach is uh, fetch happens in one clock cycle, decode happens in the next clock cycle, execute happens in the next clock cycle. And then it keeps on going like this. So in order to execute an instruction, three clock cycles are required. Depending upon the design, of course, in a simplistic view that we are having, the processor takes three clock cycles to execute one instruction. Uh, so well, and then we have pipeline processors. In pipeline processors, what happens is, uh, uh, so you have uh, the, the way the processor is designed is like a, uh, assembly chain, like in a car manufacturing company, you know, at one place, uh, the body could be assembled at some other place, tires could be fitted in the third stage, you know, the car could be painted. So at any point in time, if you look at this three stage car manufacturing assembly pipeline, there are three cars in the pipeline. And uh, so if you look at each car, each car takes, uh, it has to go through three stages. It requires three cycles of time. 
but then if you go and look at the end of the pipeline and you see, you see a car coming out of the pipeline every second. Okay, so this is the latency of execution of each instruction is three cycles, but the throughput is one instruction per clock cycle. That is the why we are able to get this throughput because we are overlapping the execution of the instructions. And then we have what are called as super pipeline processors and super scalar processors. So we will take a quick look at them. Uh, if you see uh, in this picture uh, on the screen, so, uh, so there is one uh, cycle, cycle uh, one instruction is getting executed in one clock cycle. And since we have to execute all the steps of the instruction within one clock cycle, the clock cycle length has to be large. Okay, like you will not be able to have a high frequency processor because if the processor is running at a high frequency, then uh, the width of the clock pulse will be smaller, then you will not be able to do all the work within the same clock cycle. So in single cycle processors, the processors run at a lower frequency, okay? Uh, and then of course, there are other, uh, so one important problem in single cycle processor design is, uh, the cycle length should be large enough so that the instruction which takes the largest amount of time will be able to complete. Like for example, instructions such as load, uh, memory transfer instructions typically take a lot of time so the cycle time should be large enough so that uh, the load instruction can successfully execute. Or like, for example, if you have a division instruction, floating point division instruction, or floating point multiply instruction, or double precision addition, double precision multiplication, these instructions are, uh, the circuit for these instructions they, is very complex. So uh, the length of the clock cycle should be very large so that these instructions which take really long time can also be executed. Uh, but then what happens? Uh, but there are many instructions which take very small time, add, subtract, branch, things like that. So we end up paying penalty for all those instructions. Okay? So it could be the case that 99% uh, of the time we are executing these simple instructions, but in 1% we are executing these complex instructions. But just with, to cover those 1% cases, we still end up having a very uh, no high clock pulse width and because of that low frequency. Uh, so we face the challenges. I mean, a lot of time just gets simply wasted. So, so these are the challenges with single cycle implementation. So because of that, what the processors designers did is they split it into multiple stages. Uh, in multi-cycle, this is what is called as multi-cycle implementation, which you can see in the second uh, row uh, on this slide. So like, for example, in this, you can see load instruction takes five clock cycles, store instruction takes four clock cycles, and add instruction may take three clock cycles, so on and so forth. So each instruction takes different number of clock cycles. So on the face of it, it looks like, you know, hey, instruction is taking multiple clock cycles, uh, but the important observation is uh, the length of the clock cycle is smaller. And uh, you have to design your, uh, the clock cycle time is dependent on the stage which takes the longest time. Okay, so now it is uh, the processor man designer has to be clever in seeing that all these stages are roughly balanced. So imagine if there is one stage which takes 10 nanoseconds and another stage which takes 100 nanoseconds, then your clock frequency still has to be at least 100 nanoseconds, right? So. It is, uh, it's again, it's a hardware design challenge. How do you see that all the stages have take roughly the same amount of time? Uh, and then um, uh, we have the pipeline implementation. In pipeline implementation, so let's say there is a five stage uh, pipeline uh, processor. Uh, then when you switch on the processor, initially you will see there is some time to fill the pipeline. But once the pipeline is full, and if you go sit at the end of the pipeline, 
you see an instruction coming out of the pipeline every clock cycle. Uh, and that is because we are able to execute five instructions in parallel at the same time. This is what is called as instruction pipeline. And an important idea here is the idea of what is called as instruction level parallelism. You are executing instructions in parallel. But what is uh, uh, the important note here? The important note here is from the programmer perspective, programmer still has the semantics that an instruction is fetched, decoded, executed. The semantics is defined with respect to that sequential execution. But uh, underneath in the hardware, in order to improve the performance, we are uh, uh, executing instructions in parallel. Okay. We have to respect the sequential semantics that we have given to the program. Great. So next comes superscalar processors. Superscalar processors are uh, usually in pipeline processors. In every clock cycle, you fetch only one instruction. But in superscalar processors, what they do is they issue two instructions, four instructions. When a superscalar processor issues four instructions or fetches four instructions in a single clock cycle, we say it is a four issue superscalar processor, okay? And then what happens is uh, the instructions can execute out of order. Like I have an add instruction followed by, I have a floating point add instruction followed by a subtract instruction. Floating point add instruction may take 100 clock cycles, but the following subtract instructions operands they are not dependent on the result produced by the floating point add instruction, in which case the add instruction can go ahead and execute, right? So, uh, so in all these things, so the fundamental thing that defines what is a superscalar processor, there are two things. One is uh, called as out of order execution. That is instructions can execute out of order. Uh, second is they are multi-issue because when instructions go out of order, then you will quickly, you know, kind of uh, whatever the instructions that are coming, you quickly consume them. So you have to fetch greater number of instructions from the uh, memory. So typically in pipeline processors, the best that you can get is one instruction per clock cycle throughput. But in superscalar processors, we will get, you uh, know, like maybe four instructions per clock cycle or six instructions per clock cycle is also possible. Okay. Yeah, so <coughs> all the processors that are there on your systems, on your laptops now, they are all superscalar processors. Uh, superscalar processors, uh, again, although the instructions execute out of order, the net semantics that we give to the programmer is fetch, decode, execute, fetch, decode, execute, semantics. So what is the advantage uh, in this uh, model of providing, uh, giving performance to the programmer is the programmer need not bother about changing his program. He can still write his C programs. Okay, he can still, uh, you know, uh, he don't need to worry about all these things. Uh, so he can move from one generation Intel uh, Pentium 1 processor to Pentium 2 or Intel Xeon, you know, one version of Xeon processor to another version of Xeon processor. Uh, he don't need to worry about any of those things because uh, the compiler and the underlying hardware automatically gives performance to the user. Okay, till pretty much 2000, this is how uh, performance is driven uh, uh, in, in the computing space. Processor manufacturers, they retain the semantics that is given to the programmers and they keep on improving the underlying processor uh, hardware infrastructure, design ideas. They come up with excellent ideas. And uh, so through that, they were giving performance and programmers are happy because you buy a new processor and perhaps you get the latest version of the compiler, at best you have to recompile the code or sometimes, uh, many times it's not even necessary to recompile the code and everything is very transparent. Okay. 
But as you can see, uh, as we keep moving from single cycle to multi-cycle to pipeline to super uh, scalar processors, uh, the complexity of the underlying design, it just keeps uh, blowing up and down, up and up. Because you have to, like for example, when you are processing multiple instructions, uh, many challenges will come. Like for example, there are two independent instructions, both of them want to use the same uh, uh, multiplier circuit. Uh, then we get what is called as a structural hazard. So one way of resolving structural hazard is uh, to have two modules of multiplier circuit. That may not completely solve the problem because you may want to issue three instructions in parallel, okay? Uh, and then uh, other challenges are like, for example, how do you figure out that the subtract instruction following the floating point add instruction is independent of that instruction? You have to figure that out automatically in the hardware. And then, so your life is good as long as instructions are going in a straight line, but when you hit a branch instruction, uh, you are not sure whether, uh, what is the next instruction you should be fetching? You can either go to the beginning of the loop or you come out of the loop, two possible paths are there. So branch instructions act as a wall. Okay, you cannot proceed cross the branch instruction. So processors, they speculate. Uh, how do they speculate? They know, we all know that when we have a loop, most of the time we jump back. They speculate that could be the path taken by the instruction stream. They start speculating, they start executing. So if you speculatively start executing, so million times the loop iteration goes well. And in the last iteration, uh, it will be wrong. Your speculation, your path that you have speculated is fa false. So you want to come, you want to take a different path in the program. Uh, but then if you execute the wrong, but the last uh, iteration could be very important because that's the time when you could be depositing the money in your bank account. And what's the point in doing everything and not depositing money in your bank, okay? So you have to squash, you have to roll back the instructions that you have executed. So this brings very interesting challenges because you execute the instructions and you don't commit them until you are 100% sure that, they are that those instructions are meant to be executed. Once you are sure that the instructions are meant to be executed, you commit them. But once you come to know, hey, these instructions are not meant to be executed, you roll back the results and you start taking the different path. So super complex stuff happens at the hardware level to give you very good performance. And uh, so as the complexity of the underlying circuit increases, uh, so naturally uh, the number of uh, gates required increases. As the number of gates increases, remember each gate is realized using transistors. The number of transistors required uh, increases. Uh, so you should be able to, like for example, let's say uh, 30 years back, if there is, if the processor uh, uh, the first uh, generation of Intel processors, if they have, let's say, 50,000 to 1 lakh uh, uh, transistors in a chip, now you will have billion transistors in a chip. Okay, and you want, uh, but still, the, no, my, the, the M1 processor on my laptop, if you open, it will just be this much size. Okay, maybe one and a half inch by one and a half inch size. So, and uh, where, uh, so what really helped, what really propelled processor manufacturers, uh, helped man processor manufacturers to take this path is what is called as a Moore's law. So what Moore's law says uh, is roughly every two to three years, the number of transistors that you can pack in unit area, it roughly doubles. That is the transistor density roughly doubles for every two to three years. And if you think about that, it's an exponentially growing function. So because of that, uh, and it's not a law in the sense of physics law, Moore is Intel's uh, uh, first CEO, I guess, and CEO or CTO founder, uh, he just predicted it. 
but then all you uh, know solid state physics guys they worked hard to you know keep to keep up uh, the dreams of uh, murala okay and uh, it's still kind of going but we will see what are the other challenges that we are facing so because of this uh, ability to use and more and more transistors uh, processor manufacturers continuously kept increasing the complexity of the superscalar processors but then new set of uh, challenges came in just because people say hey moore's law says this and then because of it processor performance increases just because you have more transistors doesn't mean you have more performance you should be able to cleverly put those transistors for use and that's what uh, designers of superscalar processors do okay the second the challenge is uh, the first challenge is uh, this okay uh, there is no we are not seeing any challenges but right now this is the path taken okay uh, but the first challenge that we see is the basic way by which superscalar process gives performance is by using instruction level parallelism they want to schedule instructions which are not dependent on each other to execute in parallel uh, but the problem is the amount of parallelism that is available that is inherent in a program is limited right i mean it's not like there is an infinite amount of parallelism that is there so all the programs that you write that's how you think right there is a step 1 of the algorithm step 2 of the algorithm step 3 of the algorithm and there is a macro dependency between step 1 and step 2 and uh, no and from step 2 to step 3 but within step two, there will be some level of parallelism in terms of when you plan things out, you can do some things in parallel, but there's a limit to it. So this is what is called as a uh, ILP wall. Okay, so there's a limit to how much instruction level parallelism that we can exploit. Okay, so this is the first challenge, ILP wall. Uh, the second challenge is uh, clock speed. Okay, uh, so if you, if the, let's say if we have a micro architecture, uh, we have a micro architecture, you are not going to change anything about the micro architecture. Micro architecture means the design of the processor. Everything about the micro architecture remains the same. But instead of using gates uh, that, that have a 10 nanosecond delay, you use gates which have five nanoseconds delay or six nanoseconds delay. And you will be able to do that because uh, in the process of shrinking the transistors so that we can pack more of them in the same space, uh, the length of the transistor decreases. So we will be able to switch on and off the transistor in a smaller amount of time. So naturally the gain that we get uh, there gets uh, lifted up to the gates also. So now what happens is the remember the clock cycle time is determined by the critical path length. So if uh, transistor sizes shrink and if the delays gate delays go down, the naturally critical path length decreases. And if the critical path length decreases, then a processor which you are running at two gig speed, you will be able to run it at 2.5 gigs. So, but then there are challenges here also, because what happens is as you keep increasing the clock speed, as you uh, as you keep increasing the clock speed, what happens is uh, the switching activity in the transistors increase, and the power dissipated is proportional to the switching activity. Okay, in other words. Power dissipated is cube is proportional to cube of the frequency, okay, and the number of transistors present in your system, on your chip. So lot of immense amount of heat gets uh, generated. So I don't know how many you may have experienced it. You no, know, when you start doing gaming or on your mobile phone, uh, uh, if you start playing, you know, you, you will see start feeling heat on your uh, thumb. Okay, so power dissipation, a uh, lot of power gets generated and it needs to be dissipated. And there is this interesting picture which says, you know, if the clock frequency just kept on increasing, 
at some point you know it would uh, the temperature generated would be equivalent to the temperature in a nuclear reactor rocket nozzle sun surface before all that happens the processor will melt under its own heat uh, it's generated okay so so because of that when i was at your age it's very quite common for us to see uh, know that uh, Intel releases two gig processor, and after a year, it releases two point two, two point three gig processor. But if you see the processor frequency in the last five years, six years, they tapered. They, they are not increased. They remain more or less the same. But around three gig, they kind of settle down, and it didn't increase because uh, it's not possible to increase the clock speed any further. Okay. So this is what is called as a power wall. Okay. This is what is called as a power wall. So interestingly, power is a very, since we are still be studying about high performance computing in this course, power plays very important role in two, uh, two ends of the spectrum of computing. One end is the mobile space, mobile phones. On mobile phones, power is important because you don't want to drain out the battery. Okay. On the, at the other end in the data center also, you don't want to, uh, the power is very important because since large number of computing machines, perhaps 50,000 to 1 lakh uh, computing machines are packed in a very small area, the overall heat generated, the power generated will be very high. And to dissipate that power that gets generated in a data center is very, very challenging task. Okay, so two extremes, power is very important on the data center side and on the mobile phone side. In between on our laptops, desktops, it's a kind of all right, so the game is okay. But on the two extremes, it's very important, power generation. And then there is a, uh, so that the third problem, this is power, power wall, ILP wall, power wall, and the third one is the memory wall. You keep on increasing the processor speed, but uh, the latency to access to get a uh, no word of data from memory, it is still uh, uh, it, it didn't the, the it still it didn't improve at the same rate at which the processor speeds increased. Okay, that means earlier, let's say ten uh, no couple of years back, uh, the processor is able to. Uh, uh, no, execute million instructions per second. Uh, so two years later, it is uh, it can execute two million instructions per second. But memory should be able to supply those two inst million instructions to the processor. If, we, if it is not able to supply those two million instructions to the processor, then it's not going to work. The processor will just idle. It will stop. So this is what is called as a memory wall. And this turns out to be an extremely challenging problem. It's a very, very challenging problem. And we spend at least two, three lectures in this course on how to work with this, work on this. So if you see this memory hierarchy, um, so on the top you have registers, registers are within the processor. So the access time is within a clock cycle. And then there is an L1 cache sitting on the processor. Usually L1 and L2 cache these days, both will be on the chip only. L3 cache could be off chip. And then there is DRAM. And then after DRAM, you have you know, secondary storage structures. And then you can have remote uh, data that is present on uh, remote uh, uh, disks. So as we keep uh, till we are at the DRAM, uh, the kind of techniques that we use, they fall under some category. But once we go out of the DRAM and we start accessing data that is present on the hard disk, then the game changes. Okay, And the game changes further when we go beyond and try to access data that is present on uh, another machine where we have to access the network to get that data. So that is where this whole area of big data processing comes into picture. In big data processing, the data is so huge, there are terabytes of data, petabytes of data, and the data you cannot even store in one place. And this data is present, stored in a distributed fashion. How do you process them? How do you elicit information from them? 
So that is where distributed uh, big data processing kicks in. In this course, we will not look at uh, distributed big data processing. Okay, what we will look at is uh, high performance computing where uh, we, you may not really work with uh, that large amounts of data, but the amount of compute that we have to do is still substantial. Okay, so that's the focus in this course. Uh, but that is fun, okay? So once you kind of start accessing the hard disk, the challenges that you face. Uh, and next class, I forgot to include the data uh, here. What every computer programmer should know about uh, latency numbers. Okay, so uh, it is something in order to they, they, there is this notion called as humanized latency. And uh, what is humanized latency? When you compare the time taken to access data and register versus the time taken to access data on the network, which is present in a remote loca location storage. So if accessing uh, registers is, let's say, if it's equivalent to brushing your teeth, then uh, Accessing remote data is equivalent to one whole uh, semester worth of time. Okay, you see the scale. So we will not be able to realize it or appreciate it until we interpret it uh, and look at from this perspective. So that's a fun data. Let's look at it in the next class. I will show it to you in the next class or in one of the classes. Uh, let's keep going. Yeah. So this is where the state of the art when you were born this is <laughs> for approximately yeah so this is these are the challenges people were uh, uh, grappling when you were crawling okay. uh, yeah so now you are destined to solve all these problems you are born to do solve all these problems <laughs> okay so now so instruction wall memory wall power wall these are the three problems uh, uh, so that the community faced in uh, uh, in 2000 around 2010 so till early 2000 till that time um, the story is very simple the processor manufacturer he just works on his uh, how to come up with a better micro architecture that's the challenge which processor manufacturers were working on and the compiler writer closely works with the processor designer to figure out how to use all the features provided by the processor designer uh, so that he can uh, uh, use the underlying architecture better. Okay. The job of a compiler designer is twofold. Number one, all the interesting features which the compiler, which the processor designer gives, he should use them to the fullest. Number two uh, is uh, uh, what's number two? The number two is there are every processor it has to be while designing, it has to make some trade offs. So there will be some weak points. So the compiler writer has to hide those uh, weak points. Okay, so these are the two uh, things which the compiler writer should keep in mind. Technically speaking, even the compiler writer should not know about, need not be knowing about. Uh, all these things because the processor designer wants to do everything transparent to the programmer, including the compiler writer. But in practice, it's not going to happen because uh, uh, you unnecessarily make the hardware so complex. But uh, but then if the processor designer talks with the compiler writer and says, you know what, uh, so I'm facing this problem. Uh, will you be able to solve this while generating code? Uh, then the compiler writer says, sometimes he says, yeah, it is difficult, but sometimes he says, uh, I, I will be able to manage and uh, able to take care of it while generating code. He can give both answers. Uh, sometimes the compiler writer may give a, a misjudge his ability in uh, generating good code, and he may give a wrong commitment, or the processor designer by force extract a wrong commitment from the compiler designer. And uh, such projects are doomed, okay? Because uh, when you are doing this processor design, it's a very, it's very, very expensive design cycle. Three years of design cycle, 
thousands of engineers involved you know billions of dollars involved in designing shipping out new processors and uh, so there are uh, like for example an example of uh, one such uh, processor is hp and intel together came with what is called as an itanium processor the itanium processor is not a super scalar processor it uses what is called as a vliw architecture so when you go for a vliw architecture the compiler writer has to really struggle a lot to get a lot of things done uh, and the compiler writers couldn't uh, you know deliver the performance uh, uh, they hoped or expected from them so that's a it didn't quite go well the itanium project <coughs> anyway but the point is uh, till 2000 so processor designers and compiler writers they work together and uh, but the programmer never need to worry about it you just write your java programs you write your c c++ programs all good uh, so when you try to optimize that's a good time because the, when the underlying architecture is uh, fixed when the underlying compiler is fixed then you can focus on coming up with a better algorithm. So, okay, instead of bubble sort, you come up with match sort. Instead of match sort, you go with quick sort or, you know, so all these things, uh, uh, there is no change in the uh, architecture. The architecture is fixed. But then let's say suddenly someone says, you know, hey, instead of one core processor, you have two core processor, then you have, uh, suddenly uh, the problem the design space explodes by uh, by a factor of two you have to check between uh, quick sort and bubble sort and uh, merge sort uh, you have to compare their performance on a single core processor with a double core processor on a single core processor perhaps merge sort is good but if you have a double core processor maybe quick sort is good so the design space, just by adding one more core, it just exploded, okay, doubled. Okay. So every time what happens is an additional dimension is added in the hardware structure and is exposed to the user. You know, that adds to the complexity, that adds to the uh, design space of the programs, which uh, we have to explore to get a good performance for. And this turns out to be a very, very difficult problem to solve. Very, very difficult problem. Because if I fix the architecture, then uh, if, if let's say, let's say for a homework, if one architecture, if one architecture is fixed, and if I give a problem and ask you to give, get the best performance out of it, then if it takes three months, then if I give you uh, two different machines and I ask you to come up with a program, uh, which gives the best performance then you have to look look at the machine architecture of machine one architecture of machine two and then you know uh, so many possibilities will come and instead of three months you may take uh, six months and it will just not be six months it could be nine months because the if the architecture of the new system is new you have to learn it it's not easy to learn a new architecture and you get a good hang of it so there's a learning cycle and uh, so, so there are all the challenges, associated challenges here. Okay. So till this point, the programmer's job is to find better algorithms. But then, uh, so since because of the ILP wall and memory wall and uh, power wall, uh, so we cannot keep on increasing the uh, performance of superscalar processors, but Moore's law still, uh, was holding good, has been holding good. That is, we are able to get more and more transistors. So what do you do? Uh, like if you are, you know, let's say if you keep getting bricks and cement, you keep on uh, going vertical up and up and up. And uh, after some time, if uh, the building is about to collapse, uh, so what do you do? But you're still getting bricks and cement. So you construct a house next to it and you, know, you keep constructing. So that's what happened. So processors started having uh, multiple cores, okay? So I think all of you may have, if you see at least state, you may be having a quad core processor. That would be my guess, at least a quad core processor. And not only some of you may be having six cores also, 
uh, not only this, there is this idea of hyper threading. So that means effectively 12 hardware threads are available. Let's say if you have a quad core machine with hyper threading available, the number of hardware threads will be eight. Number of hardware threads will be eight. And then every processor will have what is called as a SIMD unit, that is vector instruction set. Like for example, when you are adding two 128 uh, byte arrays, okay, or let's say you are adding two uh, array, yeah, let's say, yeah, what's the big deal? So let's use 128 byte arrays. Uh, so if you add element by element, it may take 128 clock cycles to execute uh, that 128 byte array. But if you are doing addition of uh, four elements at a time, then you'll get a fourfold speed up. So that is, this is what is called as a vector processing units. SIMD, single instruction, multiple data stream units or vector processing units. Uh, so because of them, you can get a very good uh, speed up. Uh, we will try to do good amount of programming in this course to see how we can use vector instruction sets available on processors to get uh, uh, good performance. So one homework I have for you is check the width of the SIMD lane. That is whether you will be able to add uh, four instructions at a time, eight instructions at a time, 128 instructions at a time, or 512 instructions, 512 data uh, items at a time. Check on your system. What is the width of the SIMD unit? Okay. What is the specific instruction set that you are using? Please check. And then, of course, uh, we have cache. So caches are there, L1 cache, L2 cache, last level cache, and then uh, main memory. Uh, so if you have data on the L1 cache uh, versus data on the main memory cache, so on the main memory, there will be at least 1,000 times the speed up that you will get if the data is present in the cache. But you cannot have all the data on the cache because uh, the size of the cache is small in the order of MPs. Okay. Uh, so you can see the dimensions of optimization. If you see before, here we are just worrying about coming up with better algorithms in the regular processors. Now, in the multi core, SIMD, cache enabled processors, you have to worry about code vectorization, thread level parallelism, memory locality and cache interference, like for example, you brought the data from the memory and put it in the cache, but uh, there is some other process running on, this, on some other code. It is evicting the data that you are bringing on the last level cache because they are sharing the same cache. So there will be a huge amount of cache interference. How do you reduce the cache interference? Okay, it's a very challenging problem, not an easy. So now, so this is a multi-core system for everything within the core. And when we go to the next uh, stage, uh, in the next stage, in the next level of complexity is, if you look at server class machines, server class machines, on the same motherboard, you will see multiple processors, two processors, four processors, eight processors you can find on the same motherboard. Perhaps not more than eight processors, four processors could be the max. So if you have four processors, each processor has you know, some 16 cores in it, then the whole, uh, all processors put together in your server, they will have 64 cores and including hardware threads, you will have 128 uh, hardware threads. Then how do you go about using this? Then there are interesting challenges comes into picture here if you see the picture here, uh, if your thread is running on multi-code processor one, and if the data on which the thread is working on, if it is present in memory module one, which is local to that processor, the latency will be smaller when compared to the case if the data is present in memory module two, because it's a remote memory access. Remote means not on other machine, but on the same machine, but still it is remote. So you want the data to be local to the processor on which the thread is running. 
okay, all right, you do your best to accomplish this. But then what happens, you know, you know how operating system works. It is not aware of uh, the program properties. It can schedule out your process or thread and it can, when it is reschedules it, it can reschedule it in other way. Okay, then suddenly the performance of your program goes down because all the data accesses are now removed. How do we solve this problem? So we have to tell the operating system Pin my process, pin my process or thread to this code. Don't schedule it out and put it on another code. That means it. Uh, that also means you need to have the privilege to tell the operating system to pin your own process. Okay. So now, uh, the challenges that you are seeing as a programmer, they are passed on to the operating system. What kind of operating system? Um, uh, features should be there so that your program wouldn't lose out on performance. Not only that, if you see operating system itself, if you have 128 core processor and naturally you will have you know, 128 or 256 or 500 thread uh, threads running on the system. If you go look at the kernel of the operating system, in the kernel of the operating system, there will be many data structures. Like for example, there could be a data structure which maintains the list of all processes. So whenever you want to go and change that shared data structure, you have to acquire a lock so that you know, the state of the data structure is not corrupted. You do the changes, you release the lock and you come out. Okay. Uh, so now, that uh, data structure, that Linux, that data structure which is being used in Linux kernel three years back, four years back, it's not at all an issue. But now suddenly it becomes an issue because uh, the insertion requests or you know, the, the modification requests on that linker list has substantially increased. So what happens is all these, uh, they are waiting on a queue. Uh, because in order to modify the data structure, you have to get a lock, only one thread can get the lock. So everyone is standing on the queue and the whole system is halting. Okay, so now how do we solve this problem? So to solve this problem, so people have come up with interesting uh, concurrent data structures called as lock-free data structures, where you don't hold a lock and much worse is you hold a lock and you die, okay, then that's much worse. Okay, if it's a user process, it's not a big deal. Automatically, the lock may go. But if it's a, even if it's, but uh, if it's a important kernel process, and if it dies holding a lock, then the whole system goes to deadlock. So there is a huge amount of work on how to design lock-free data structures. Very very interesting ideas. When you use lock-free data structures, the throughput suddenly increases. Okay, the insertion throughput, the modification, deletion throughput increases substantially. So, so what is the moral of the story? The hardware changes that we are seeing, they have an impact on the programmer, they have an impact on the compiler writer, they have an impact on the operating system at all the levels, it has an impact. Okay, so, well, the story still doesn't end there. So you have a GPU, NVIDIA comes into the picture and it says, uh, hey, I have, uh, so there's this fantastic GPUs, they have 1,000 small cores, not uh, four big cores, such as uh, four or eight big cores, such as Intel. <coughs> the way these 1,000 cores are organized in a GPU, they have very different. They will be clustered into 1,000 cores. They will be divided into 10 clusters. Each cluster may have 100 cores, 100 small cores. And uh, the whole programming model just changes. The programming model that you have in mind and the programming model, the fetch, the programming model that you have, the C programming model that you have in mind has evolved from the processor uh, abstraction, execution abstraction that is given to us, that is fetch, decode, and execute. But that is no longer relevant if you just go to GPUs. Okay. So you are in trouble there. Okay, so you have to completely think about uh, uh, every algorithm that you would have learned 
in uh, so far you have to rethink about all those algorithms every algorithm you have to rethink if you want to port that algorithm to a gpu uh, machine on your system okay and if you go to gpu so many very interesting complex problems come in there and if nvidia says hey here is my gpu then intel says competitor uh, competitor says hey here is my xeon phi accelerator and xeon phi accelerator it has its own uh, architecture okay so uh, so if i just take a very simple sorting problem if i uh, if you take that problem and if you want to come up with a best solution best performing thing then it's a nightmare because uh, uh, GPU, multi-core, NUMA, Xeon Phi, all these things, they will be thrown at your face and you have to figure out a solution. Because of this reason, if you see from 2000, from 2005 to 2020, and even now also, there's a huge number of uh, research papers where they take a specific problem, where they take a specific problem and try to determine a good performance point for this for that uh, specific problem, comparing it against all the available architectures that are. Before 2000, the game is, is you work at the compiler level or you try to come up with a algorithm with a better time complexity or space complexity, but now uh, the game is uh, different, okay? Well, it's just not uh, one accelerator. Your system can have multiple accelerators. Uh, you can, you have like, for example, Google has TPUs to accelerate deep learning computations. And then there are FPGs. Uh, so when you think about it, so now when you have all these compute resources, you can a new model of computation, which is called as heterogeneous model of computing has come up. That is, if you have two important compute intensive routines, A and B on your, as a part of your program, A could be better suited for GPU, but B could be better suited for multi-core. So you have A running on the GPU, B running on the CPU, multi-core CPU, and they communicate with each other. And they, when they communicate with each other, they communicate with each other on a PCI Express bus. Now, how do you design your algorithm so that you hide this communication latency between these two entities? Earlier, you were never worried about the communication latency when you are writing your programs. But now communication latency has even come, come into picture. You have to hide that communication latency. So, yeah, so beyond the single core computing, one Neumann model of sequential com computation, it doesn't hold. And all the challenges that I have mentioned, uh, they are non-trivial problems to solve. They are very, very non-trivial problems to solve. And the story doesn't end there. Okay, if you go to a data center, you can have multiple nodes. Every node has its own local storage. And there is a remote storage, which is called on a storage area network, perhaps. And these nodes are connected by a gigabit Ethernet or by an InfiniBand network. Uh, you no, know, and uh, optimizing uh, uh, your program execution time on this cluster of machines. So far, we, this is all single node computation. We are all within single node. So now we moved from single node to a cluster of machines, to a cluster of machines. Okay. Well, so in order to solve this problem, if you go see, there are tons of programming frameworks, computational frameworks available. P threads, OpenMP, thread building blocks, OpenCL, you know, OpenCC, ACC, CUDA. You know, just to read them out, it takes so much time. And if you have to learn all of them, then you can imagine uh, how hard it is. Okay. Did you, between, did you do p programming in your course? In your OS course you did, right? p -threads. good. So typically, you know, when uh, we don't want to use p because uh, prone to errors and lots of challenges when you write code using p -threads. So we want to get away with p and come up with a, use better programming language abstractions to do. 
So now the challenge before us is how to translate. If you see the combined computing power, like for example, you see, you know, HAPC uh, supercomputer top 100 list, this and no, or things like that. It can do uh, one petascale petops or something like that you will hear. But uh, that is the raw computing power. In order to translate that raw computing power, like for example, if this laptop can perform 1 trillion operations per second, it doesn't mean that I will get that kind of performance. That is a raw, that means if you mindlessly keep num doing number crunching, that's what you get. But you have to translate this raw compute power into application performance gains. Okay. So translating this raw computing power into application performance gains, it involves uh, innovation in terms of algorithms, programming language abstractions, compilers, runtime environments. You know, like for example, an example of a runtime environment is Java Virtual Machine. So Java virtual machine, so you know, like when you give a Java program for execution, it interprets all the Java bytecode because the Java program is not translated to native code. <coughs> but what the runtime system will do is it identifies the hotspots in your program as it is executing, and it automatically translates those hotspot code into native code and optimizes them in a way uh, which is specific to that the particular uh, chunk of code. Because when once the program is in execution, you know like whether between uh, which functions it is frequently calling, okay? And uh, it can inline those functions. Lots of interesting things uh, the virtual machine can do. Uh, this is what is called as dynamic compilation. Dynamic compilation is when the program is executing, you the with the runtime understands the behavior of the program and dynamically optimizes the program so that it gets the best performance for that program so innovations in runtime system operating system uh, support and architectural support like for example where in architectural support comes in order to support log free data structures you need support from hardware instructions okay like for example an example of uh, a hardware instruction which helps in designing log free data structures is what is called as a CAS instruction, compare and swap instruction. Did you study compare and swap instruction in your CSO course? Maybe, may not be. Usually, you may not study because it doesn't have the, there is no context in CSO course to introduce that instruction. But CAS instruction is an instruction which helps uh, in designing log free data structures. And the research in the architecture space is uh, what are what kind of synchronization primitives we can introduce at the hardware level uh, so that uh, designing these data structures, log free data structures, etc., becomes uh, easy. Okay. Well, when people, when all the processor manufacturers have buried their head in trying to figure out all the support systems they can give. Uh, so that the programmers can, will be able to accelerate uh, the performance of their application. Uh, there are uh, people, there are many security issues that uh, have come in, like Spectre, Meltdown. Uh, people exploit uh, some of these things and uh, no, they will be able to, there are what are called as side channel attacks. They will be able to figure out information about the program that is running on your processor. Uh, so, of course, uh, security, uh, those are not the focus of uh, uh, this, uh, no, this, uh, this course, but I am telling you that there's a whole bunch of problems, but uh, uh, when a typical engineer focuses all his attention on this, there is one guy who is looking at you sideways and he figures out, hey, I can exploit this and get in information out of uh, the program that is under execution. Okay, these are called as side channel attacks. Again, there are a whole lot of research happening on side channel attacks and how to prevent those side channel attacks on your system. Okay. So the problem statement that we have here is, uh, so there's a uh, problem specification and we want to come up with an optimal program orchestration strategy. 
Okay, so there is a problem. It's not at the algorithm level. The problem is at a different level. The problem is there is let's say this bunch of data. You transform this bunch of data and give me give the data in a sorted fashion. Or there could be a problem uh, in bioinformatics space or finance space, uh, and uh, the problems are uh, specified in a architecture independent fashion, and we have to come up with a program orchestration strategy so that we can use underlying architecture in the best possible way. And the expectation of people until at least 10, a decade back is uh, somehow the compiler does magically uh, all these transformations and give you the best optimal orchestration strategy, but it doesn't really, it, it didn't happen. But there is a lot of research on auto parallelization on how to transform your program so that we can better use the memory hierarchy. There's a lot of research back then and there has this research going on now also. And there's a huge area of research in compilers which is called as polyhedral compilation where they try to achieve this goal. But the challenges are very, very hard problems to solve. So the uh, whatever uh, the compiler the research community is able to accomplish is within is very limited uh, but uh, so there's a lot of scope uh, not only for compiler writers but as application program programmers uh, we need to learn uh, different frameworks different approaches so that we can get the best performance out of these systems so as i said the challenge is uh, with all these things the design space is extremely large. Okay. When you write programs in your data structures course, when you write programs in your uh, uh, C programming course, what do you program for? What do you program for? That is programming for correctness. You keep seeing OJ, is it correct? Correct, accept, accept, that's what you see. <laughs> programming for correctness. Now we are moving from programming for correctness to programming for performance okay that is the theme of uh, this course how do we program for performance okay. so yeah so that's the story um, and uh, we take we use uh, analytical techniques we use heuristic search techniques we use machine learning techniques in order to navigate through this uh, huge design space uh, and uh, that's the theme for this whole course. So, so with this, I will stop uh, today's lecture. And if you have any questions, we can ask. Them. I'm sorry to rush through like this. Uh, there's always this hybrid mode, you know, like when there's a conversation, uh, people who watch later, they may not be able to get it. So because of that, uh, I have to rush through, but we can ask questions now. So this, uh, if you look at this compute intensive problems, just to kind of, uh, where do you see the applications? Like for example, there is one huge area of research called as bioinformatics, uh, where genome sequencing and uh, many, many compute intensive tasks in that space uh, are there. So bioinformatics is one space and uh, high frequency trading. So where you, know, you get all the data and you want to compute things uh, in less than milliseconds or microseconds uh, so that you can gain an advantage for your competitor in your bids, high frequency trading or uh, weather climate analysis, um, uh, weather prediction, or uh, one big area of uh, space research is, uh, domain is uh, oil and gas exploration. So you know, they do a lot of uh, analysis. Uh, geologists do lots of uh, analysis. They collect a lot of data and they try to do analysis to find out, hey, this is the place where, which has very high likelihood of uh, tapping into oil in an easy way. Uh, so, so what are the areas are there? And then uh, modeling, uh, 
material modeling like even so there is again in material sciences you want to come up with novel materials with good properties so you do lots of simulation to figure out the properties of materials uh, so in all these uh, there are so many places where uh, uh, you know uh, where expediting accelerating performance becomes uh, an important Or in self-driving cars, you know, like uh, you look at the surroundings and uh, you want to analyze the scene and figure out the pedestrians, the cars before you, you know, surrounding. So what happens if you take, uh, if you figure out that there's a pedestrian before you, after you hit the pedestrian? <laughs> so it's there, it's very real time, you know, in milliseconds. Uh, the, it's a really very real time computation that we have to do. See, there is some questions in the chat. What sports in general? We'll think about it later. Okay, then. So that's all I have. If you don't have any questions, we can stop here. Uh,